Leonard, the concept of multiple universes, pocket universes, bubble universes, developed by Alan Guth, Andre Linde, uh, others, uh, have really revolutionized our understanding of, of, of how big reality can possibly be. Yes. From the standpoint of a string theorist, someone who is deeply concerned about explaining reality, how have you incorporated those ideas into your worldview? Yeah. Well, if I understand correctly, these ideas that, uh, that you've mentioned by people who are other than me, the idea of multiple universes, how they come out of inflation, is basically that inflation is a mechanism for creating all the diversity in different places in the universe that is possible. Everything that is possible within the framework of the equations of a theory will appear someplace. So if the theory has a solution with this property or with that property or with some other property, someplace it will appear, and not just once, many, 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 many times over. Uh, so those ideas will lead to a universe which is populated by many, many bubbles. But the question is, how many different kinds of bubbles are there? You can imagine that there are only two different kinds of bubbles, a universe of this type, <laughs> A, or that type, B. What string theory brings to it is something about the number of possibilities. It's not just A and B. It's not just A through Z. But the number of possible kinds of universes, the number of possibilities that are inherent in the equations, is nobody knows how big. But it's numbers which are far, far bigger than the number of atoms in the universe, far, far bigger than anything you can think of. The number 10 to the 500 gets bandied about a lot. 10 to the 500, not 10 to the 500 different little pocket universes, but 10 to the 500 types of them, each one being repeated over and over again. Now, the reason that that is, or at least one of the reasons why we find that important is because it provides a possible natural explanation as opposed to supernatural explanation for this anthropic idea. Namely, the idea is that the universe is so diverse, so big, so diverse, that there will be pockets in it. No matter how unlikely those pockets may be, there will be pockets where the conditions happen to be right for life to exist. Most likely, if this view is correct, Almost all of this multiverse is sterile, is not full of life, is dead, it's inflating too fast, all sorts of bad things are happening, it doesn't have electrons. The constants of physics are constants just of physics are wrong. in the wrong direction. Right. But just like here and there there's a planet that you can live on, here and there there's an environment or a pocket universe which is at the right spot on the landscape for all of the things to come together which are required for life. So according to this view, we are a very, very rare phenomenon. The universe was not created and, uh, just to uniformly be able to describe life everywhere, so to have life in it everywhere. It was just a big random thing that had so much randomness to it that here and there conditions were right. Okay, let, let, let's take the situation of these multiple universes being generated chaotically by inflation in, in virtually an infinite way, and these 10 to the 500th approximately uh, 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 possibilities that string theory can have, as you say, these vacua that get yes. string theory could exist in. Yes. Uh, wh what, is the, what is the relationship between, between these two? Both are talked about very much, most of the time independently, Occasionally, as, as you've done, bringing, trying to bring them together. Yeah. W w what, which generates the other? W which is the primal force and which is the result as well, they work together? I don't think it's a question of cause and effect of one and the other. They're two separate things. Yes. Uh, the space of possibilities, in other words, the collection of all possible kinds of universes that can exist, it is very similar, in a way, to the space of all possible kinds of creatures that can exist. That's and that's a, very big. And that's string theory. That's string that's theory. The ten, and by that's the way, you the, get to the 10 to the 500th approximately by geometrically that's right. by rotating. Studying, that's right. By studying the various ways that you can combine microscopic geometries together, 
and at least 10 to the 500 have been counted. <laughs> okay. So it's uh, estimated. Been counted. estimated. <laughs> right. That's correct. So on the one hand, string theory gives you the analog of the different number of ways of rearranging a DNA molecule. Okay. Okay. Right? What inflation brings to it is the other side of the coin. How do you bring these different universes with different DNA, how do you bring them into existence? So it's much, much more like uh, the way the biosphere formed from a bunch of carbon, a bunch of oxygen, some Darwinian evolution, uh, various uh, survival of the fittest, all these kind of things came together and created all of these different patterns which were inherent in the theory of DNA. In the same way, eternal inflation populates, creates more and more space, more and more space, and that space simply just fills up all of the different possibilities that are inherent in the equations. Let me try this metaphor, see if, yeah. see if it works. Uh, that the, the uh, string theory is, with, if you have a deck of 52 cards, all mm -hmm. the different ways the 52 cards can be arranged, and inflation shuffles the deck and deals them out. No. <laughs> No. Inflation makes more and more decks. Each one shif shuffled differently. Okay, Sh sure. Inflation, sure. Doesn't, inflation doesn't take one deck and reshuffle it. It makes It just creates more and more and more and decks of cards. But each, each one, one shuffled differently. differently. Yeah. Okay, great. That's the... Uh, right. So we have this, the possibilities of how the cards are ordered in, in a deck. Right. Inflation just makes lots and lots of these, and yep. each one shuffles them differently. <laughs> it's a but it's more than 52 It's a card possibles. factory, <laughs> but the cards come out in each, uh, each time they're created, they're created different, in different right. order. Right, right. Different and, of course, order. there's much more than 52 in the analogy. And there's much more <laughs> than 52. <laughs> right. Okay, right. okay. So um, actually, with just 52 cards, you can get a hell of a yeah, lot of arrangements. <laughs> uh, They're factorial. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, as you see these two fairly powerful theories in today's world, ha how do you see progress being made? Do you, do you see next steps? Oh, boy. Do you see no, next steps? Yeah, that. Right. So there are two kinds of progress that you can imagine. One is at the theoretical level, and one is at observational, uh, experimental level. Okay. Theoretically, I think we will simply learn to explore this landscape better and better, find out what's there, and eventually perhaps find our own place in that landscape, which means like finding out exactly, not perhaps exactly, but approximately what combinations of base pairs in the DNA add up to a uh, human being. Mm -hmm. We may be able to figure out which combination of these elements put together in various ways create a universe like our own and check that there is such a possibility. So that's an entirely theoretical uh, uh, enterprise. We may also be able to better understand the mathematics of this eternal inflation and convince ourselves, uh, convince, uh, it's not a question of convincing ourselves, it's convincing the, uh, the opponents yeah. that the mathematics holds together, that, uh, that the theory holds together and makes good sense. Now, that is a long ways to go, but the critics, and, and, and I must say the critics are of course correct, that it's not enough. You have to find some way of confirming this by observation, by experimental evidence, and that's where the hard stuff is. Mm. It is, the answer I am afraid is nobody really knows. We have, we are rapidly coming to the end of the possibility of doing experiments within a human lifetime. Current experiments in particle physics, that's the very small, from inception to completion is 25, 30 years. It involves building an accelerator that's uh, 50 miles big and so forth. Incidentally, an accelerator that could probe the scales that we're really interested in would have to be as big as the galaxy and it would have to use a trillion barrels of oil a second to fuel it. <laughs> so we're coming to the end of where we can really directly probe these kind of things. And that's very frightening. I mean, f uh, frightening for somebody who has invested that much of their life in these things. On the, on the observational and cosmolo cosmological, uh, we're, we're beginning to see things as big as the horizon. 
we know that we cannot see things bigger than the horizon. And so again, we're coming to the end of observation. There are two ways to make progress. One way is entirely theoretical, mathematical, and that entails understanding this landscape much better, finding our own place in it, understanding the mathematics of eternal inflation much better, and convincing ourselves that it's a mathematically correct theory. That's on the theoretical side. That will not be entirely satisfactory to most people. They will want to see experimental and observational con uh, um, confirmation. We're not going to see other pocket universes. They're outside the horizon. They're too far away. They're uh, outside our experience. What we may be able to do is to look into the past. And by looking into the past, discover that our universe was born from one of these bubble nucleations. This is possible, that we will be able to look into the past and see uh, the event which gave rise to our universe being a nucleation from another point in the landscape. That is possible. But quite frankly, the possibilities, the experimental possibilities are very limited and very, very hard. So I am not optimistic that we will see a great deal of experimental evidence in this direction, at least in the short term.